Hello and welcome to the Lowy Institute Live. This is the first event of the Long Distance Lowy Institute and this is the way that we're going to be operating while the COVID-19 social distancing measures are affecting every aspect of our lives. One consequence of the virus is that we're unable to welcome events to our premises at 31 Bly Street in Sydney. So we're going to be live streaming all of our events until we're able to return there. We've been very gratified to see so many of our subscribers and audience register for this event, not just from Sydney, but from around Australia and even from around the world. A warm welcome to you all. My name is Alex Oliver and I'm the Director of Research for the Lowy Institute. Joining me today are Executive Director, Dr. Michael Fullerlove and Richard McGregor, our Senior Fellow and Leading China Expert to discuss the impact of the virus on the great geopolitical rivalry of our time, that between the two competing superpowers, the United States and China. Some quick housekeeping as this is the first Lowy Institute live event. On the base of your screens, you'll see a Q&A button, and that's where you can submit questions to the panelists. We'll be reviewing and moderating <coughs> those questions throughout proceedings and during the Q&A session later in the event. We've also received questions submitted during the registration process, but please put your questions through and we'll gather them and respond to as many as we can later in the event. I'll ask you please to include the name of your organisation or any other affiliation when you send through your questions. But first to our panellists, hello Michael and Richard. Good morning. Hi there. Michael, first to you. The global upheaval caused by this COVID-19 pandemic has jolted what was already the greatest geopolitical rivalry of the 21st century into a new period of uncertainty. You've been critical, it's fair to say, of the Trump administration and its American first foreign policy, which has been highly transactional in the conduct of its foreign affairs. Where has this left the US in terms of global leadership and how is it going to come off in this latest round of the US-China battle? Thank you, Alex. Well, the United States was already self-isolating under President Trump before coronavirus. We know that President Trump came to office in 2017 oblivious to the advantages of global leadership. We saw that with the Iran deal, the TPP, the Paris Accord, his, his approach to alliances. Uh, what he had in his favour was that in that period, President Trump didn't face an externally generated serious crisis. He had plenty of problems and crises, but he brought most of those on himself. Now he faces a, an external crisis and it's a doozy. And America is facing a health crisis, an economic crisis, and Americans' last line of defense is the Donald. So I think this is a sobering moment for Americans and for Americanophiles and for observers of America. Uh, Washington's approach has not, not to coronavirus has not been impressive. The president himself, I feel, has, has flailed around. He has he started out sort of denying the significance of corona, comparing it to the common flu, uh, calling it a hoax, spreading misinformation. Um, he has sharpened up that performance a little bit, but the testing performance in the United States is still uh, dreadful. Um, his press conferences still seem to be remarkably self-absorbed for a, a world leader. Um, and you certainly, you look at the footage out of New York and other cities, and these are very arresting sites for, uh, for the world. I mean, we're used to thinking of America as uh, the epicenter of global power, not the epicenter of global disease. Um, there's a long way to run, and, and hopefully America can improve its performance. It's obviously President Trump is not the only element of the performance. There have been other elements that have probably slowed down America's response, the individualistic nature of American culture, the, the hyper-partisanship of, of the country. But so far, it has not been impressive. America looks feverish. It looks a bit disoriented. Um, it looks weak. Uh, so I, friends of America really hope that it can turn its performance around because I think Inevitably, this is affecting the way the world thinks of America, and probably it will also have implications for how America thinks about the world. And speaking of the epicenter of global disease, Richard, um, China's been a rising power for decades now since it's opening up. And I noticed Kishore Mubabani published a new book last week, 
provocatively titled Has China Won? No doubt that was written entirely before the COVID crisis, but it's a potent question to ask right now. Has China won, do you think, or is it too soon to say? Well, Kishore, um, he's a former senior Singaporean public servant and academic. Uh, three months ago, a book titled Has China Won would have looked spectacularly ill-timed. Uh, maybe it looks a little bit better now. Um, uh, the, the idea, though, that China has won, and this is an idea I think that China is putting out around the world these days, uh, really, it, it, it holds up in some respects, not in others. L let me go through it for, for you. I mean, Kishore, for example, uh, has been writing about more about Asia than China. Um, it's almost like if he'd had a series of books, it would have been, uh, is China winning? Will China win? And now we has, have, has China won? He used to write about the Asian ascendancy. Now it's the China ascendancy. But if you look at the course of COVID-19 uh, in the region, uh, there are many different ways to, to tackle this um, virus and there are many different ways to bring down infections, not just the Chinese way. Um, we have look at South Korea, uh, look at most prominently of all uh, Taiwan. Uh, you might have looked at Japan and Singapore a few weeks ago, but they're having the struggles of their own now. Look at Touchwood, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand was described today not just as flattening the curve, but crushing the curve. So the Chinese, you know, there's no doubt that China had success. The brutal quarantine worked as far as it went. Um, and if we look at where we are right now, yesterday, China, for the first time since January 21, recorded no deaths. The US in the last 24 hours has recorded 2,000 deaths. Now, you'll get many people saying, of course, we can't believe the Chinese figures, and I understand that, but I think we can believe the Chinese trend. In other words, you can't really hide a virus like this uh, to the point where you, um, you know, wipe out any knowledge of it at all. So I basically believe that the number of new infections is low in China and the number of deaths, new deaths uh, is right down. So that does bring us to an important point that Kishore, Kishore is making that we must uh, confront that this is not just about US and China, that's what we're talking about today, but when we look at US and China, it's not just a contest of economies. It's not just a contest of militaries. It's not just about trade wars. It's a contest of systems. And if China does come out of this much more strongly, then the ruling Communist Party, including Xi Jinping, they will feel bulletproof because they've gone through many crises over the past couple of decades and they've always come out of them. And if they come out of this one, uh, while the US flounders, uh, they'll be confident, uh, they'll be more emboldened in their foreign policy, uh, they'll be more assertive, uh, they'll want a bigger role in international institutions, and they'll be willing to take greater risks. So, you know, I don't think China has won, but, you know, incredibly, as it seems from just a few months ago, uh, China might come out of this looking better than the United States. You raise an interesting point about the context of systems there and China's assertiveness. But Michael, um, there's been quite an esoteric aspect of this war between the US and China, and that's the war of words, specifically the war of words about the virus. President Trump and some of his White House officials have insisted on calling the coronavirus the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus. And China's responded with its own propaganda at home and abroad, calling it the USA virus. Is this war of words significant, do you think? Well, the timing of it is not ideal. I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, you would prefer to think that leaders in the White House and Zhongnan Hai were cooperating to beat the bug rather than um, competing to throw the blame. Um, having said that, I, this is coming. Uh, whether it comes now or in, it comes in a month, the, it comes in a month, the the battle for responsibility of this virus is coming. It will be significant um, because there's a lot of geopolitics in this virus. It's a bit like, you know, 100 years later, we're still arguing who was responsible for World, for world War I, who was responsible. We still argue about Vietnam and, and other issues. So how, who was responsible for this, for bringing this blight to the world and how different countries dealt with it will be an important part of the ideological and national competition in over the next few years. Now, um, I, I think I'd 
in terms of that point, I would come at it slightly differently from, from Richard. I think that China has been impressive in the way that it has, it has um, arrested the spread, obviously, uh, within China. But, um, but I don't, and Beijing is up on its hind legs at the moment. It feels it's got a good story to tell. It's trying to put the virus to work for the Chinese Communist Party. But I'm not sure this will work out the way China thinks it will, because um, ultimately the same authoritarian system that allowed it to clamp down on the virus was also responsible for covering it up for months and allowing it to disperse from Wuhan to the world. And so if in six months or a year, there are armies of dead around the world and the world is, is the, the global economy has been battered or shattered by this virus, the idea that China will go blameless and the Chinese system will be, um, will be, uh, you know, will, will be praised uh, doesn't, doesn't quite seem, doesn't quite seem right, right to me. I mean, I think that, as I say, there are elements of their system that have worked, but in the end, I think we are all going to squint our eyes and say, China allowed that thing to get out of the box and that has changed the world for the rest of us. And I don't see how that can fail to drain some of the confidence and belief we have in China. I mean, for the last few decades, China has been a source of late capital and labor and innovation. Um, and now it's a source of disease. And I think that has to affect Beijing's soft power in the future. So some reputational damage for sure. Um, Richard, speaking of that, there've been some wild conspiracy theories going literally viral on social media channels in the past two months on both sides of this rivalry. There are stories that China sowed the d disease deliberately to weaken the United States and enhance China's own position. There are stories that the US military launched this as a biological weapon against China to bring it metaphorically to its knees. How have these stories caught hold in China? Uh, I think they've probably caught deep hold. Just let me go back to what Michael said. I think he's right in this respect is that if, if we're writing a book about COVID-19, China would like you to read just the end of the book as it stands now. They don't want you to look at the first few chapters and what happened with the initial uh, cover up and mismanagement um, of the virus. And that's where most of the uh, conspiracy theories or accusations being traded by the US and China are focused on. Um, you know, first of all, uh, uh, President Trump and uh, Secretary Pompeo were talking about the Wuhan virus and the Chinese virus. Uh, this angered the Chinese, of course, because that pinpoints the origin quite uh, starkly. Um, and the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, then in retaliation for that, in fact, that's exactly what he said yesterday, he, start, he, he said he was speaking in retaliation he started to spread from the podium at the foreign ministry in Beijing wild conspiracy theories about how this virus may have, may have been brought to Wuhan by a US servicewoman some months before when there were international military games uh, in Wuhan. I mean, this is an absolutely crazy, unfounded um, theory. Uh, it comes from a sort of conspiracy uh, website in Canada, helped on by some sort of people in their living rooms in Virginia, uh, in the United States. Um, but I think if you ask me whether do people believe this in China, it's hard to do a quick survey of this sort of thing. But I think that it's in a very fertile soil to take on a, a conspiracy like this. The other side of it, which I think hasn't really been promoted from the top of the US government and tops of other governments, uh, but I certainly hear it on talkback radio in Australia all the time, and I suspect you hear it overseas as well, is that China deliberately engineered this virus, deliberately let it out to hobble the world economy, uh, to accelerate its takeover uh, of the world. I'm sorry, it's not more sophisticated than that. And this, this conspiracy theory holds that, um, you know, China, they don't value life so much, they can lose a few thousand here, a few thousand there. It doesn't really matter uh, if the end game is global domination. You know, it sounds like a bad James Bond film. Um, so they've been competing against other, each other. It is noteworthy as of uh, about a week that uh, Washington and Beijing seem to have both agreed to step back from this, uh, to not uh, hit each other from the respective podiums of each government. 
Uh, but as Michael say, says, um, uh, we'll be debating the origins uh, for a long time, and that is a debate that China is extremely uncomfortable with. Mm. Speaking of podiums, uh, Richard, um, Michael, I wanted to ask you about the podium contest that's going to go on in November of this year. Um, you've studied the Trump presidency right since the beginning of his administration in, in late 2016. You've been very critical of the administration's response to the crisis. And yet on average, US opinion polls in the past few weeks show that Trump's approval rating is actually at an all-time high of around 50% of the population. What do you think this crisis means for, for the election in, to, in uh, November this year and, and uh, President Trump's prospects? Well, first of all, it seems that Americans aren't listening um, to me and, and some experts, uh, but let's see. Look, the Americans have a choice in how the country goes forward. That's one of the advantages of being a democracy. And in November, Americans can either decide to course correct or they can continue. Uh, they can say that uh, we want a more orthodox form of uh, president, probably in the form of uh, Joe Biden, who's likely to be the Democratic um, nominee, although that, that is not formalized yet and Bernie Sanders is, is still in the race. Or they can look at the last four months and the last four years and they can say, we want more of that, more please. And I think on that decision rests a great deal of significance. So I think it really uh, behoves us all to watch it very closely. Now, before the ele before coronavirus, I thought I felt that President Trump had the advantage in, in re-election, not, not, notwithstanding the maladministration that had taken place under his presidency. And the reasons are, first of all, that incumbents usually get re-elected in the American system. It's unusual for incumbents not to get re-elected for a second term. And secondly, uh, they almost always get re-elected when the economy is going well and the economy was going strongly. Coronavirus scrambles that. Um, the economy is now tanking. The US economy uh, is in for a very grave period as, in, as is indeed the, the global economy and, and developed economies and developing economies around the world. But on the other hand, the value of incumbency increases in a crisis and American pollsters for many decades have pointed to the rally, rally around the flag effect in, the United, in, in US politics. And you've seen that, you, you, you alluded to the Gallup poll, which has increased in improve for President Trump. So I think I would say that it all depends really, a lot of, most of it comes down to now President Trump's performance on coronavirus and his perceived performance. If he is perceived to, to do well, he, we see now he's trying to adopt a new tone, a more sober tone in his press conferences. If the curve starts to flatten, if Americans start to get over it, then they may feel they don't want to change horses midstream. We'll have to see. The other party, of course, in this is, is the opponent who, as I mentioned, is we think, we think it'll be Joe Biden. Um, I know Richard uh, covered Joe Biden on the campaign trail. At the Institute, we hosted Joe Biden a few years ago. Um, he has some strengths. He has the strengths of experience and some wisdom. He's been around a long time. He's an empathetic character. He's sort of the anti-Trump in many ways, but he has vulnerabilities too. One of them is his age. He's, he's not a young man. He looks his age. Um, and age, old age, I think, is a vulnerability uh, at this moment because of coronavirus. Um, but also he, because he doesn't have the value of incumbency. He's an opposition leader, I guess, in, a, in, a, in, in, in our terms. He's a challenger. And I think around the world, you're seeing that governments that are doing okay are getting a boost at the moment. Their people want them to do well. That's only natural. In Australia, in France, in, uh, in the UK, and in the United States. And so um, it, I think in the United States, the advantage is probably at the moment with Trump, but it depends on his performance in battling coronavirus. Hmm. Um, Richard, I might bring you in here um, since you have um, a lot of familiarity with, with Joe Biden from covering um, his earlier campaign. Um, with Trump as a wartime president, 
Um, what, what options do the Democrats have, and Joe Biden in particular, in inserting themselves into this? Or is it, is it just not worth it? Is it better for them to stand back? Well, I mean, Trump is a self-styled wartime president. We're not actually in a war, but he's probably getting a little bit of the boost that, you know, a, a leader in a crisis gets, as Michael said. Uh, at any time like that, particularly when you're in the US, you don't have a formal system of opposition, and Joe Biden is still running in the primaries, Biden is not going to get much uh, oxygen, if you like. Uh, but, you know, I've always thought that Trump is very beatable, depending on who the uh, candidate against him is. Uh, if you look at the turnout in the uh, midterms a couple of years ago, if you look at the turnout uh, in the Democratic primaries, it's way up. Uh, and there are a lot of people who want to get out and vote against Trump. If you look at Biden in particular, I followed him in 2012 when he was the vice president for Mr. Obama, and he was campaigning in states like uh, Wisconsin, in Michigan, uh, in Pennsylvania, and he was specifically sent there by the Obama campaign to give a, you know, a strong anti-trade message, actually, and he's always been very effective at that. Um, but of course, you know, I mean, Mr. Biden is as about as old as Mr. Trump, but, you know, he seems to have some sort of lack of cognitive fluency at times, to, to put it generously. Uh, Trump is a very effective campaigner. Uh, it's impossible to say if he'll win, but I think Biden uh, would have a very good chance. Mm. Um, I'm, uh, Michael raised earlier the, que the question of the economic impact and the uh, economy scrambling in this health crisis, but also a very important economic crisis. But, but going back a bit in, in relation to the US-China rivalry, one of the first major moves, Richard, of the Trump administration against China was to initiate a trade war that followed, and there followed a tit-for-tat round of tariffs um, from mid-2018, and a truce of sorts was reached in January of this year, one side or both uh, would have been weakened by that trade war. What happens to the trade war now? Well, the trade war, for want of a better way of putting it, is on the back burner. In theory, of course, uh, there's a whole series of commitments coming out of the trade war going over a period of two years. Most prominently in Mr. Trump's mind is the issue of uh, purchases of American goods, including agricultural goods. Uh, Mr. Trump said the other day he wasn't too pleased at the rate at which that had started, but a lot of those purchases are backloaded, in other words, until next year. Uh, so the jury is out on that. But, you know, um, China, you know, we, we're all pretty familiar with uh, what's happening in the US economy, but the Chinese economy is still reeling from the effects of COVID-19. Um, you know, you saw some uh, estimates that they had, I think, the worst few months, and we're going to get the worst quarter since 1976, the end of the Cultural Revolution. Um, uh, a very prominent Chinese economist the other day said China was gonna have its worst few months uh, economically since the Tang Dynasty. And by the way, the Tang Dynasty is from the seventh century to the 10th century. So, you know, it's pretty tough there. So China uh, is getting back on its feet in terms of people being out and about, cities coming back to life, people that get workers are getting back to their factories but there's little demand inside China because people have taken a big hit economically. And of course, demand outside of China uh, for their exports is taken a massive hit as well. So China's got its own big economic issues. And when we think about China as a winner from this, uh, Western countries have been through uh, de uh, recessions, depressions in their time, uh, and you know, continued as democracies and recovered. China has not had a real recession uh, for a long, long time, certainly not since in the way we measure it since the 70s. So it's, it's, they're, they're gonna go through a very testing period. Xi Jinping will go through a very testing period unless we can get a, they can get a snap back in their economy. Right now, it's not on the horizon. Mm. Um, looking um, further across the horizon and, and perhaps um, back home in Australia. Michael, how's this crisis affected Australia's position given its economic reliance on China, the weakened state of the global economy in general, the weakened state of the US, our alliance partner? Uh, how, how, do you, um, how do you look at, say, for example, Scott Morrison's um, response to the crisis vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, it, it, I think it has the risk of, of weakening 
um, our regard for and our relationship with both countries, actually. I mean, you had seen in Lowy Institute polling in recent years that, for example, trust, Australians' trust in China dropped by 20% last year, uh, and Australians were uncomfortable with many aspects of President Trump's leadership of the United States, and that was uh, troubling them about the United States. Um, and I think Corona will raise questions in Australians' minds about both countries. On the United States side, as I, as I mentioned, the United States is our great ally. It is our security guarantor. It is uh, one of the pillars of our foreign policy. We don't really have a plan B apart from the United States. And yet um, the United States response to Corona has not been impressive and it's not what one would want to see from your big, your great ally and, and the, the most uh, important country in the world. On the China side, um, Similarly, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think this will, you're already starting to see um, some elements of the Australian debate uh, wondering about whether we have put too many of our eggs in our basket with China and wondering whether we should put our di some distance between ourselves and China. You're certainly seeing that debate in other Western countries really breaking out. You're seeing some Western, some Western commentators really saying we should set our face against uh, against the PRC. I'm not sure if Australia has that option for the reasons, some of the reasons that Richard mentioned. Um, our economy is, is, is going to be severely weakened, notwithstanding the good measures that the government has introduced. We are going to need China to purchase our, continue purchasing our exports, to provide us with imports, to be a source of, of growth. Um, uh, so I don't think China is an optional extra for Australia. Um, and so that's why I think you've seen, to come to your question, you've seen Scott Morrison um, be very careful in his comments um, on, on China. But I think, I think um, given the importance of both the United States and China have in our worldview and in our foreign policy, it's a troubling fact that neither of them are having an impressive coronavirus crisis. If I can make one positive point, the countries, if both the superpowers have been a bit lacklustre so far in different ways, middle powers, some of our middle powers have provided leadership and, and a path forward, perhaps. Um, and if you look at different elements of the crisis, Singapore, South Korea, Germany, to some extent, obviously, it's a, that's a big power. But you're seeing that middle level, some of those, some of the most impressive our national responses have come from middle powers with which we can compare ourselves with, competent states with, with rational uh, politicians, with effective bureaucracy. So maybe we will see, uh, maybe as Australians, we'll take some inspiration from that. Maybe we'll see more coalitions of the competent where, um, because we're a bit troubled by the performance of the Americans and the, and the Chinese, we, we thicken our connections with other fellow middle powers, including those in our own region. Thickening of connections. And, and speaking of that, um, Richard, uh, is this going to see, uh, you know, some sort of distancing between ourselves and China, some sort of diversification away from China, uh, uh, you know, a degree of decoupling? I, I'm thinking about education, uh, Australia's tourism industry. Is that likely as, as the Australian economy um, tries to emerge from the economic impact of this crisis? Well, Australia went into this crisis with a strong economic relationship with China and very poor political relationship. Uh, I don't think um, much has changed in that respect. At the start of the, uh, uh, this crisis in January, when Australia closed its borders to China, China accused it us of overreacting. I don't think anybody would say that now particularly as China has done the same in, in, in reverse. But, you know, uh, as Michael said, all countries are going to come out of these, this crisis with weaker economies. Uh, is that the time when any leader looking for economic growth, looking for a strong budget, looking at uh, tax receipts and the like, is going to take on uh, a sort of an, a, a generational shift in the economic uh, direction of a country? Uh, in the case of Australia and China, of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about how we need to diversify. Intellectually, that's absolutely right. How do you diversify? Uh, 
uh, given what we're offering. Can we go off and sell our mineral resources uh, in such bulk to other countries? Uh, it's not so easy. Um, having said that, there are some parts of the economy which I think will take a semi-permanent uh, hit. Tourism and international students, which are an important part of the relationship with China. Uh, we had uh, uh, about 90 direct flights, I think, um, from China to Sydney every week. Uh, people in the business expect that to be reset at about 60. In other words, about a third lower. That's, uh, that's many, many thousands fewer in tourists. Uh, the same goes for the other airports around the country. If you look at international students, uh, I think we'd probably reach the peak of Chinese uh, international students from China, but there's no doubt that this is going to leave a sour taste in many people's mouths who came here, not necessarily the fault uh, in the short term of Australia, but our universities uh, have become far too dependent on fee paying students from China. I get the sense that there are many people in the federal government, including in the federal government, who think this is a perfect time for a reset. So the university is going to take a massive hit uh, in income. But as to sort of looking for a complete reset uh, of our economic relationship, we might want to bring some manufacturing onshore in pharmaceuticals, uh, in medical protective equipment. But it, realistically, will Scott Morrison come out of this in six months and say, OK, let's reset our economy now just when he's looking for growth? Uh, uh, I think that would be pretty risky. Mm. And I think um, the Vice Chancellor of ANU this morning uh, made very similar points about having reached perhaps peak international students at our universities. Um, Richard, just just staying with you, you know, what what happens if if COVID nineteen actually doesn't change the US China contest that much? Say both of them come out of this economically weaker, um, as Michael said, politically weaker, diplomatically diminished. Will they just simply resume the, their geopolitical contest for influence? Yes, I think they uh, resume hostilities in one form, form and another. I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's multifaceted. It's geopolitics. It's military. It's about trade. Uh, it's regional. Uh, it's hearts and minds. Uh, it's a contest of systems, of ideologies, if you like. Um, and both sides increasingly see it in a zero-sum fashion. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are fewer and fewer parts of the systems in both countries that want to take a step back. And I think you were asking earlier about whether it was important to look at the way each side was talking about each other now, you know, the conspiracy theories and the like. Mm. And I think that's very important because they were trading barbs at each other. But in, in reality, their audiences were basically internal, particularly in China, propaganda to their own people to make sure that they knew their own government was doing a good job and it could all be blamed on somewhere else. Now, that's a pretty sour part, uh, you know, uh, position to start uh, uh, or to improve a relationship from. Um, Michael, you know, we're turning from China now um, back to America, um, I get the sense that you are somewhat disillusioned about American, American leadership. Has the response to COVID changed your mind about anything as you've watched it unfold? Well, I would say the Trump presidency has shaken my faith in America and the Trump's response to the coronavirus is part of that. Um, I, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic about this a couple of months ago, um, just saying how you know, I've been American afar my whole life and I'm really dismayed to see um, what has happened in the United States in the past couple of months. And um, there are certainly elements of, of the, the corona response that add to that. On the other hand, I, I, I intended that article as a call to arms, if anything, um, a modest call to arms, let me put it that way because I, I still think the United States has huge strengths. Um, its demography is much better than China's. Um, the economic potential, the innovation in the United States, um, the, the appeal of the United States um, to the world is still enormous. So I think the world still wants to believe in America. Um, America has a lot to work with, but Americans need to help us believe. I think if Americans take a good hard look at the last four years and say, yes, 
that's exactly what we ordered last time. We'll have another uh, serving of that, please. Then I think a lot of people around the world will start to wonder whether America, whether they'd got America wrong or whether America had changed. But if America course corrects in November, then, then I still think it has enormous, um, it has enormous potential and it has enormous strengths that many other countries would like to have. Xi Jinping would like to have a lot of America's strengths. So uh, all eyes turn to November, I think. Course correction, I'm sure um, many of us will be looking forward to that. Um, Richard, I want to ask you about reading material, actually. Um, there's been so much of it to read in the last few months as people have uh, been self-isolating, having a bit of time on their hands, desperate for information about what's going on, trying to interpret, um, interpret this new world, the COVID world that we're living in. What's your advice to non-experts about how to understand China during this crisis? So are there interesting people that we should be reading or following on our social media accounts? Well, there's a whole um, uh, host of um, uh, people to be following on Twitter, I guess. That's where I get most of my information from, or by following people there. Uh, in terms of Xi Jinping China, there's a very good, uh, uh, Xi Jinping's China, there's a very good website, uh, Reading the China Dream. That is very good. Uh, I think the Western press, much maligned, uh, uh, both in the US and in China, of course, has been, been doing a terrific job uh, in covering this crisis, even as uh, a few of their members have been thrown out of the country. Uh, I should say, though, that one of the best sources uh, throughout this uh, period has been Chinese journalists. Um, you know, Chinese journalists instinctively understand their country, frankly, much better than we do. They, you know, they grew up there. Uh, that they can, they can talk to people, I think, in a much more intimate fashion when they're able to. And in the early stages of this crisis, we got some really, truly fantastic Chinese journalism. The, the magazine Caixing and Caijing, uh, both longstanding publications which have always tried to push the boundaries, uh, did pioneering or path-breaking work on what happened in Wuhan, uh, what happened between Wuhan and the central government, what happened in the particular instrumentalities of the Wuhan government and the health commission and the like, the debate there, the delay in getting the information out, the suppression of the information. Um, so that's been uh, uh, some of those Chinese journalists, particularly Chinese citizen journalists who worked at that time, have now been either detained or, uh, you know, kept at home and not allowed to report. Uh, but the magazines are mostly still going strong. And I really commend people following them because then you get the, an authentic Chinese take on it, um, uh, which has been great to see. Well, that should keep Google Translate busy for a bit. Um, Michael, one last question to you before I turn to the audience for their questions. The crisis has had obviously broader implications than for the rivalry between the United States and China. It's a global health crisis, an economic crisis on a scale rarely if ever seen before. It doesn't discriminate between rich or poor nations, powerful or weak. And then of course, the latest evidence of that is clear with the hospitalization of the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Now we posted um, Boris Johnson a couple of times at the Institute. And I thought you might like to reflect on that. Yeah, thank you. It, it, um, it shows that neither how insidious the virus is really, that neither status nor power is a defence against it. And one of the issues I've wondered about uh, that will be focusing the minds of the Secret Service and the Shin Bet and the AFP and, and other police forces, security services around the world, how do you protect your leaders from an invisible enemy like this? How do you maintain the, the functions of government? And how do you maintain confidence in government which requires keeping your leaders and your decision makers healthy. It really is, it's a sort of a challenge that they're not used to and we're not used to. In terms of Boris, um, you're quite right. We hosted uh, Mr. Johnson twice, once when he was mayor of London, once when he was foreign secretary and he gave the Lowy lecture a couple of years ago. Um, he, was, he has been one of my very favorite guests. I mean, he's a complete original, highly intelligent, very funny, very charming, um, but someone with a seriously well-developed worldview, somebody, very impressive person, also somebody with enormous uh, 
personal energy and vigor. So um, I have every confidence that, um, that Boris will be back on his feet soon. Um, I, I back Boris, uh, as they say, on Twitter, and I look forward to seeing him back at 10 Downing Street. I think we all do. Um, thank you both. Um, it's time now to go to the audience um, for questions. Now, this is the, um, the neat technical trick. As I mentioned earlier, we've been receiving questions throughout the event. If you haven't done so already and you'd like to put a question to the panel, please do so now. I'll, I'll try and get to as many of them as we can in the remaining 15 or 20 minutes that we've got. Now, I wanted to go firstly uh, to a question from Margaret Stone, actually, one of our... Um, one of our great supporters, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, IGES. And Margaret has asked the question uh, about what this pandemic has revealed about the relative competence of democratic versus authoritarian societies. What, which one of those systems, if you like, has got the upper hand? And what are the implications for the Australian government? Um, would uh, one or either of you like to, to jump in there and ask that, answer that? Well, I'll say I'll say something um, first. I mean, I think what it there's you know the the Chinese system uh, initially covered this up and mismanaged, but since then it, you, we've got an example of incredible state capacity in China, whether you like it or not, uh, whether you think it's used for good or bad, that they are able to lock down as many at one count as 760 million people in in home quarantine of one form or another and regulate that right down to the last street and every mobile phone. It's kind of, you might think it's scary, but that's genuine state capacity. You look at the US, it's much more fractured. I think the state has been run down in the US, relentless attacks on governments for decades. Uh, I think in Australia, for example, we're seeing we've got pretty great state capacity actually, uh, relatively speaking. The health system in particular, the public health system, uh, shown to be of great value um, at the moment. Uh, but the Chinese state capacity, the ability, ability of the Communist Party to leverage it, uh, has been another profound reminder of just how big a challenge uh, China is. Margaret, you want to... Yeah, go on. Yeah, well, for, well, thank you to Margaret Stone for the question. I think both... I think the virus reveals that both the authoritarian and democratic systems have the faults of their qualities in a way. The authoritarian system as, uh, systems, as Richard alludes to, can be good at the, the, the controlling of the population, the draconian measures that are good at stopping the outbreak, but they're less good as they've demonstrated at the transparency that is required to, to admit error and to share um, lessons with others. And the democracies, on the other hand, tend to be good at the transparency and not so good at the draconian measures. Um, but ultimately, it, it doesn't feel to me like the, the real divide in the world on coronavirus is between authoritarians and de Democrats. It seems to be between competent countries and incompetent countries, because some authoritarian states have done well, and I would agree, I'd associate myself with Richard's remarks about China's impressive state capacity, which is, which is as impressive as it is worrying. Um, Vietnam also seems to have um, done quite well in our region, but then a number of democracies like South Korea and, and Germany are doing well and quasi-democracies like, or controlled democracies like Singapore. So, um, so it's not so much authoritarian and, and de de versus de Democrats. I think it's more um, competent states with, um, with, uh, with state capacity versus less competent states. And at the moment, I agree with Richard, Australia, the, the deep state in Australia has performed pretty well, whereas the deep state in the United States, for example, doesn't look very deep at the moment. And then, of course, there's a performance of, of those democracies, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, I guess, proving that this is not about authoritarian and democratic responses, but about competency. So um, good point there. I have a question from Mark Soares, who is from the office of the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese. Um, and he, he asked where uh, the analysts are making much of some assistance with personal protective equipment, gear, and offers of a technical assistance. But is that a long bow to suggest that this swings China into a new 
dominant position. Uh, he says, surely uh, there's work still needs to be done for China to get there. Will it step up um, on the substantial financial assistance that recovery will re require? And I note that um, that uh, some shipments of personal protective equipment from China have been um, have been rejected for being defective. Richard, do you want to have a, a, a go at answering that question from Mark? Well, Shaw? China China sucked all the personal protective equipment out of the world in January and February. Now it's spending it all around the world. Uh, now, as their infections go down, um, and they're doing it in such a sort of um, high profile fashion like we save the world type fashion you know there's no doubt that the equipment is welcome um but it sort of becomes you know it's delivered in a very sort of politically heavy-handed fashion you know you have to be sort of photographed at the airport thanking china for this gift whereas i think most of it has been bought on commercial terms um and the like so uh Will it help China? It's very hard to say, actually. In some countries, people will be grateful. Others will resent the fact that it's, being, it's a sort of charity being given to them um, uh, for which China is uh, expecting great thanks. But certainly, it's another example of the Chinese system that they can turn around from disaster tr to triumph in just about two seconds and, and, and manage the flow of gear at the same time. Um, will it help them in the end? Um, it depends on what people think about the origins of the crisis uh, compared to the end. Speaking of the origins, um, with you, Richard, again, uh, Bonnie Glazer, who's one of our non-resident fellows and also a senior China analyst at uh, CSIS in Washington, DC, one of our fellow uh, think tanks over there. Um, she said that China watches are divided over whether the COVID-19 crisis will strengthen or weaken Xi Jinping's control and legitimacy of the CCP and Richard, um, you've written on that in in a in a piece which we're shortly to publish, actually, in which Bonnie has also made a contribution to um, uh, in, in a few days. What's your assessment, Richard, of, of how this affects Xi's control um, and his position with the CCP, since the, particularly since he's made himself um, president for life? Well, everything seems to entrench him further. Nothing seems to knock him off his perch. So you'd be a brave person. Uh, as I might have been in the past, to suggest that um, this might diminish his power at all. Uh, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's impulse at any different time is more control, not less control. Uh, I think in the case of this crisis, there should have been greater transparency. Whether, in fact, he takes that lesson out of it, I'm not so sure. Uh, there's been a couple of people arrested in China in the past week. Uh, one, a prominent member of the party, sort of a semi-princeling, uh, who's now been suspended from the party a year after he wrote an absolute diatribe against Xi Jinping on his social media account. So the, the Xi's critics and Xi's enemies are all still there uh, and uh, uh, extremely sort of angry at him still for all manner of things, particularly the president for life maneuver that he pulled off a few years ago. But uh, at the moment, there's nowhere for them to go. It's simply too dangerous to oppose him in, in any real fashion. Um, so there's no new news to report on that front. Um, I have an, a question about trust from um, Anna Hyde from our audience. And this is an interesting question, actually, Michael, you mentioned earlier um, the Low Institute polls results on trust in China, which have dropped significantly. Trust in the United States and particularly in President Donald Trump has also dropped dramatically in the last couple of years in Low Institute polling. Um, there's a question of trust now in the World Health Organization and how it has responded to the crisis. Michael, how do you think um, this issue of trust is, is going to emerge as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and those institutions that have formerly been reliable um, to the citizens of the world, not just Australia? Well, it is striking, isn't it, that we're facing a global challenge and yet we're looking to the nation to deliver us from the challenge. We're not looking to multilateral institutions. Um, no one is saying all eyes are turning to New York tonight uh, to see what the Security Council is going to agree or to listen to a speech from uh, the president, from the, the Secretary General. Um, so it, it is interesting that when, when the rubber hits the road, we look to the nation, we listen to speeches from uh, our national leaders, uh, 
We look to the state capacity that Richard has spoken about. Um, the World Health Organization has not covered itself in glory. I mean, its approach to Taiwan, to China, has compromised it, I think, to, to a significant extent. I don't know if Australians in general have really grappled with that, but what will be interesting is to see in this year's Lowy Institute poll whether the, um, whether the general good feeling that Australians have towards um, free trade, towards globalization, towards some of these factors continues. Um, when America went down the America first route, Australia really stuck in a different um, groove where we, we understood that globalization basically delivered for us that, that um, these things were good for Australia. It'll be interesting to see whether those, some, of those, some of that sentiment changes. I might add there, Alex, um, if I could, um, there's no doubt many people are going to have lots of questions about the WHO uh, in, in coming weeks and months and the like. Um, uh, the, the, it's not just the US that's been critical of WHO. I think certainly Japan has been, some European countries, uh, Australia as well. Uh, Mr. Trump overnight, I think, has talked about how the US, uh, it might pull funds out of the WTO, uh, WHO. And of course, that's the great dilemma with international organizations like this. Do you stay in them uh, and try to make them work better? or Mr. Trump's instinct is to get out. And of course, if you get out of the WHO and take your money with you, then China will be stronger inside them. Um, but there will obviously be a big debate on that topic. Mm. Um, an interesting uh, debate, which has sort of risen in the last couple of weeks has been about compensation. And there has been some 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 movement for China to actually pay, and I think there've been numbers around about six and a half billion in compensation um, due to the outbreak of COVID nineteen. And Natasha Tovo in our audience has asked if if you think Richard that this is a possible route for the United States or even other powers to push for after the pandemic has come under control, some sort of massive compensation claim against China. I doubt it very much. Um, um, let me just give you the background of this. I think one of the one of the figures was calculated by the Henry Jackson Society in the UK, which is a highly critical of China in a principled way, I might say. Um, that's where they start from, though. Of course, there, there's also been a, an influential article by a, a US academic uh, who went through in great detail making the case for this in that China, he said, had intentionally misled people about the virus. This was in breach of its regulations under global treaties governing health and the exchange of health information. And other countries therefore had a basis to uh, take action against them. But of course, as we've seen with many international treaties and obligations, most importantly recently in the South China Sea, it doesn't matter what ruling you get, you can't enforce it. And uh, this US professor said, if you can't enforce it, then perhaps you can punish China by refusing to go along with obligations to them under the same treaties. Um, so I think there's an interesting intellectual argu argument, to, argument to, be to be had. Uh, you know, I doubt the UK as a country with its colonial history would want to go down that road of um, asking other countries for compensation. Uh, the US has also played a great, great global role. Uh, it doesn't want its, its hands tied in any respect. Look at its attitude to the International Criminal Court. So I think these are interesting debates, but I really don't see it gaining any uh, traction. Mm. Um, I've got a question for Michael here from Michael Bracher, um, one of our audience members. And it's an interesting one about the, the frailties of the United States public health system. Um, we've seen images of, of, of temporary hospitals going up in Central Park, uh, discussions of the possibility of, of, in fact, burying some of the dead in parks until, um, until proper funerals and cremations can be held. They're fairly horrific images. Um, are, the, is, are the frailties of the, the health system going to work against President Trump's re-election prospects, do you think, Michael? Well, I think anybody who's traveled in the United States um, has a sort of visceral feel for 
the inconsistencies in the US health system, it's both the best and the worst. If you have a lot of money, then the, they have the best, some of the best doctors and the best hospitals in the world. But of course, millions and millions of Americans that have no health insurance whatsoever. And for most of the developed world and for Australia, that is totally unthinkable. We are, uh, as a country that is very proud to have universal health insurance, we, we, we would never go back to that sort of system. Um, I think it might help um, Biden. It might help Biden in the sense that I think this will expose to Americans the, the weaknesses or the frailties, as Michael put it, of their own system. Um, it might be the kind of shock that, is, that draws Americans' attention to the underinvestment in, in the system. Whether even if that assisted uh, President, uh, uh, Vice President Biden to be elected president, whether that would assist in wholesale change to the health system, though, is, is, is a much more difficult question. You remember when President Obama was elected, if he had a mandate to do anything, it was to change the health system. And yet that was an enormous lift for him. And the changes, many of the changes that he instituted were not as great as he had hoped they would be, and many of them have been unpicked by the Trump administration. It reinforces how, how hard it is to change a country that is as big and diverse and, and uh, loud as the United States. It's a heavily decentralized country. It's a federation that cedes a lot of power to the states. It's a country that's infected, unfortunately, with the virus of hyper, of hyper partisanship it's a system that divides authority between the executive and the legislature and therefore allows uh, special interests um, to dilute any changes that affect their narrow sectional interests. So will it um, have an, an effect on, the, on the, um, the election? I think it might. And you are seeing in many countries that, um, that people are tuning into the fact that the real heroes in our countries are um, not the, the necessarily the tech zillionaires but, or the politicians indeed, but they're the frontline workers, whether they're nurses, whether they're doctors, but also whether they're um, people doing sort of frontline, essential, poorly paid jobs in uh, checkout as truck drivers, as delivery, um, delivery people, and maybe um, not only in the United States, but around the world, maybe that will have a little, a little change in our understanding of what's important in society and what should be rewarded. So maybe in the US that will have an impact, especially on the health side. Um, whether that will lead to significant change to the US health system, I'm less sure of. Uh, Richard, one last quick question for you um, before, we, before we wrap up. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, the question of Taiwan is quite interesting, Taiwan's um, management of the coronavirus has been impressive. Anne Cain asked the question, um, do you think that will lead to greater support for Taiwan from other states, which is reversing the trend that we've seen in the last few years that um, in the distance that states have been putting between themselves and Taiwan and the pressure that China has been putting on other countries to remove Taiwan from um, all references. Do you think that's going to happen? Well, it's, it may have a, an impact in the margins in something like the WHO, where Taiwan, of course, is excluded from that and therefore didn't have easy access to perhaps vital information uh, about the pandemic. Um, now, Taiwan was blessed by, by two things here. First, they managed the issue very well. They managed it as a democracy. They also have an excellent uh, health system at the same time. They're also actually blessed by one thing, which most people have forgotten about. You know, China took economic sanctions against Taiwan last year and stopped many Chinese tourists from going Taiwan to, to Taiwan to punish them. And of course, once uh, COVID-19 broke out, that turned out to be a, a very major blessing rather than a curse. Um, uh, it, it's hard to see Taiwan getting much more international space because Thai, China makes it, it a make or break issue. And if you want to break ranks on Taiwan, you can do that. Uh, but you can be sure there'll be a, a, a big punishment awaiting around the corner. So the way for it to happen is that countries have to bind together and act uh, in unity on an issue like Taiwan to get a greater international space, because if that doesn't happen, 
then China just picks off the countries one by one. Now, I'm going to ask you both one last question very quickly. This event has been about US-China rivalry. In one sentence for you each, who's winning? Um, uh, who's winning? Michael, you should have gone first with that rather than leaving it to me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would say, uh, I hate to say this, China with an, a, a nose in front, but we're, we're barely coming into the straight. I would say I would say neither is winning, Alex. And in fact, you're seeing um, the middle powers emerge. We're seeing leadership and inspiration come not from the superpowers, but from the middle powers. And that's maybe that maybe there's a little bit of good news in that for Australia. Always a silver lining at the Lowe Institute. I want to thank you both, Michael and Richard, for this fascinating conversation today. Thank you all in the audience out there on the ether at the Long Distance Lowe Institute for joining us for our first. Lowy Institute live event. For the time being, as I said earlier, we'll be live streaming all our Lowy Institute events. So please keep an eye out on our website for the next event. If you're not yet a subscriber and you'd like to receive notifications about our events program, you can sign up on our website. We hope to see you all soon. In the meantime, from all of us at the Lowy Institute, thank you for joining us today and please stay well. <laughs>